Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. This episode is brought to you by the Tennessee Department of Tourist Development. Visit tnvacation.com to start planning your next trip to Tennessee. Today's guests are Patty Rule and Kathy Tross from the Freedom Forum. We're going to be talking a little bit about the First Amendment and the event that they're going to be bringing here to Discovery Park of America in September. Before we get started talking about this, I'd love just to share with the uh, folks listening just a little bit about your backgrounds and, and especially where it's relevant to the First Amendment and what you're talking about. Patty, why don't you go first and tell us where you came from? Oh, sure. I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and um, went to school to be a journalist. And my first job was in Huntington, West Virginia, where I spent three years until USA Today started up in Washington, D.C. And I was fortunate enough to go there. And at a certain point in time, I wanted a little different lifestyle. And I went to the Freedom Forum and got a job at the museum, um, writing and editing exhibit text. And uh, the rest is kind of history. So I've had a a glorious opportunity um, in a lot of ways to celebrate the First Amendment and freedom of the press and our other freedoms. So you were you were there when the uh, paper we now everybody knows USA Today now, but you were there when it was just an idea that um, nobody really knew if it was going to work or not, right? Absolutely, it was a, it was you know the ultimate startup. It was you know eighty different versions of the newspaper, people fainting on the composing room floor, drama, excitement, um, but really incredible to see you know to try to get people to understand what the idea was. And um, to go from being from really zero to this newspaper that now everyone knows in a very quick period of time and how it's changed the way journalism is done with color graphics, color photographs, um, sizable chunks of news that people can access in their busy lives. So um, it really had an incredible influence on the American journalism field as, as a whole. And people today who are so used to seeing USA Today and, and stuff on their phone, and they probably don't realize how foreign that idea actually was at the time. Absolutely. I mean, you know, people were just harumphing about like, oh, you know, they call, we would do little graphics that would summarize statistics that were important to people. And, you know, they called us McNuggets and McNewspaper. But, you know, after they made fun of us, they then copied the things that we were doing, you know, weather maps, things that people really want to know information about and news from all over the country. So many of us are, have have lived different places and want to know what's happening back home in Pennsylvania or New Mexico or wherever our people are from. And USA Today was all about that, too, telling everybody around the country what was going on um, in other communities. And I hadn't really thought about this until just now. But if you think about it, you know, what USA Today was back in, was it 80 something, 70? When when did it start? 82. So back in 82, you know, it's very much like our phones are today, like with little apps where you, you know, find a little news. And that's what in the mornings I have like six different little news apps that I look at. You know, so USA Today was a lot like that. Yeah, absolutely. I hope you're looking at today's front pages, Scott. We put I do. Today's front pages I'm, and with 500 newspapers around the And country. we're going to talk about that in a few minutes because I okay. do. I check that frequently. <laughs> Good. Um, Kathy, tell us more about where you came from and your uh, relationship with the First Amendment. Sure. Um, Well, I've been a working journalist all my life, most of my life. I like Patty. I worked for uh, newspapers in Michigan and California. And then I came to the Wall Street Journal in Washington, in the Washington Bureau for a lot of time. And then I went over uh, and started working for the museum in when it was over in Virginia. It was a smaller version of what became a a very important uh, and big version on Pennsylvania Avenue in D.C. a few years later. But I was really attracted to the mission, which was to celebrate and educate about the First Amendment because it had it had lifted me up as a journalist so many times. Um, it had supported me and my colleagues, and it was so unique in the world um, in a world where we see so many countries where they don't have those freedoms and journalists are um, punished, censored, and sometimes killed just for telling the truth. So it was a real passion uh, to come and work for the Freedom Forum through the museums. And Scott, you were a great part of our team at the museum in Washington, DC. 
And now we continue our work uh, without a building, but with a great cause. And that's part of the reason we're coming to Tennessee. Yeah, no doubt. We're um, very excited um, to have you guys coming. And we're going to talk a little bit more um, about what you're doing. Um, um, Kathy, t- talk to us about um, the First Amendment. Of course, you were well-versed in a, in the aspects of the First Amendment that many people in the world, in the United States especially, are not. So um, talk to us a little bit about the First Amendment. For somebody listening who maybe isn't quite you know up to speed, what is the First Amendment? Well, it's the it's our most fundamental freedoms. It protects our right uh, to not have the government interfere in what we want to talk about, our speech, uh, whether we want to pray or not worship our religion, uh, our right to assemble and march and protest for whatever causes we believe in, uh, our right to for a robust, free and fair press uh, that holds uh, those accountable that need to be held accountable and serves as a watchdog. Um, and also our right to petition the government for back to the days when we separated uh, from England, um, you know, for redress of grievances, uh, which today is probably the most used and most little known, is that too many words, <laughs> the most used and the, <laughs> the least known of the freedoms is petition, but we do it every day, right? Um, we petition uh, for so many things in our lives and actually voting is a form of petition. So um, those are the basic freedoms. Um, we know that, th- and Patty, who uh, really was key to a massive survey we did recently of thousands of Americans about their attitudes um, of, about the First Amendment can go deeper into this. But we know through that survey that the vast majority of Americans really feel the First Amendment is vital and important but they, there are misunderstandings and there are um, misconceptions um, that confuse people. And um, we, com- we completely understand that. And that's part of why we're taking this journey across America to really help folks, um, to, to help folks learn, but also so that we can listen, so that we have an opportunity to listen uh, to what people think. But Patty, Patty, what, you want to jump in uh, and, and add something? To <clears throat> sure. I mean, I think that, you know, the things that we found in our survey, <clears throat> and Kathy will talk a little bit more about, we had focus groups with people from your community, Scott, to get an idea of what people were interested in about the First Amendment, what they wanted to talk about with us. <clears throat> and we found that um, people in, in your community found that religious freedom is their, they call that their most essential freedom. And that kind of tracks with our nationwide surveys that we've been doing for 25 years we have a survey we called the First Amendment, Where America Stands. And we found that people are really feeling conflicted about even expressing their ideas in public because of, you know, cancel culture and the impact that you can have both in person and online. There's so much divisiveness in this country. But we also had this great survey finding that 61% of people think that the First Amendment can be used to help us bridge our differences. And that's great. Um, People are concerned about religious freedom. People feel that religious freedom is threatened. People are concerned about free speech on campuses where we've seen a lot of different things played out where some people don't want certain speakers to be able to even speak on public college campuses and others think everyone should be able to speak. So everything that you see on the front page of the newspapers that you check every day, Scott, um, relates to the First Amendment. It's it's everywhere. It's not just this lofty ideal. It's America. It's the way we talk to each other. Do, are you, do you think people... Um, Based on your surveys, do they miss the first part of the First Amendment, the government shall? You know, you see a lot on TikTok. You see a lot of uh, people that are angry that are saying, you have to let me do this. It's my First Amendment right. I hear that all the time. Do you think there's some confusion there about the relationship of the government and the First Amendment? Absolutely. I mean, I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions that people have, you know, when you're kicked off of Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat um, for saying something or violating their rules of of the way they want you to um, post. That is not the First Amendment. Um, It's the government. We are protected from the government interfering with our deepest thoughts, our right to publish, to speak, to assemble, to petition. But, you know, Facebook and, and, and Snapchat and other organizations like that, these are private businesses. They can set their own rules. And if you violate their rules, they're within their rights to kick you off. Now, it may violate the spirit of the free amendment, First Amendment, but the First Amendment, literally, no, that's that's perfectly permissible. Kathy, do you think um, 
you know, I know that you all have worked extensively uh, with journalists in countries that don't have the First Amendment. So can you share with listeners a little bit about what we saw, you know, when, when I worked with you all at the museum and we had the Journalist Memorial, and I know you all are continuing work in that area, you know, what what happens in countries where there is no First Amendment? Absolutely. We, um, for years at the Freedom Forum, have honored um, journalists who have literally given their lives um, to tell a story, to tell important stories in pursuit of the truth. And we have um, uh, we have a list of um, more than 2,000 journalists dating back to the mid-1800s who have died um, often some often people most often think of, of uh, journalists dying sort of in war zones or in the front lines of conflicts and that's clearly a danger zone but there are many danger zones in countries around the world where tyranny uh, is the watchword of the government and where repression is um, the way that people who have beliefs that go against the government are punished or censored and so um, yeah people face Journalists in, in Ukraine, in Russia, in uh, not in Ukraine, but trying to report the war uh, by Russia against Ukraine uh, have faced incredible censorship. And that's the modern version, um, but it goes back um, for decades. And um, it's an, I think it's a way to help connect people because we know through our surveys that people, while they value the role of a free press and they particularly value the role of a watchdog press, you know, holding uh, government and other um, entities like your local school boards or your, your local board of supervisors accountable for their actions. That's a good civics. Um, they also um, really distrust the press. And that's growing, right? There's a increasing a sort of concern about whether the, the press is trustworthy and the whole world we're in now where uh, people believe that lots of parts of the media are what, what's come to be known as fake. Um, and so to really, uh, we believe that by telling the stories of journalists who do put their lives on the line, um, it helps connect people to the really valuable work um, of a free and fair media that we all need and that we in this country really have and um, kind of don't value, <laughs> right, compared to what most people in the world have. Yeah. So, Patty, you talked, you talked a little bit about USA Today, you know, and we we went back to the 80s. Um, so obviously when you're doing the, you're doing the uh, surveys and talking to people out there, most everyone now is getting a lot of their news and things off their phone. And uh, me living in a rural community, um, you know, and getting our local rural newspapers, um, you know, I understand how important it is that um, that we have people who are watchdogs, who are reporting on what's going on in, gov in local government um, in various areas. Are you seeing social media and the internet as a threat to being able to make a newspaper, to be able to make a local rural newspaper profitable enough to continue? Or, you know, are we going to look f towards a world where we have no local news happening for us that live in small towns? Hmm. It's a hard well, question. That is a tough question. All right. I'm, 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 I'm going to quote someone whose quote I've been quoting for a long time, which is you, Scott, where you said, never bet against the optimist. And I'm an optimist. Um, I think that social media has allowed voices that have not been heard in traditional media to be heard. Um, I also think social media can be used to manipulate and distort what's really happening in the world. And um, democracy is not... Um, for the faint of heart, it's it's not an easy thing. We have to work hard to protect our democracy. So when you are sharing information on social media, is it true? Is it fair? Who's your, what's your source? Um, and I think we all need to be a little bit more responsible about the kind of information that we share. Um, I'm very heartened by the fact that there are 
local digital organizations that are popping up in communities like yours. You, you may have one as, as well in Union City, um, where there are like retired journalists and digital gurus of, of uh, current age um, who are coming together to publish things online. Well, that's what you're right. Everybody wants their news on the phone. So I'm heartened by that, but I'm also really disturbed by layoffs in, in, in newsrooms. Um, the, the business model is broken and no one's come up with a solution for it yet. Um, the fact that so many newspapers put information and news that requires reporters to work for months and years to get information uh, free online was a probably a bad decision um, early on when newspapers were struggling with coming into the digital era. But I'm optimistic. I, 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 I want there to be um, a place for journalists, and I want us to treasure the fact that these people are out there working every day to find information that affects your life and my life about the school board and Congress and the dog catcher down the street. It's really important. Um, Kathy, can you talking about newspapers and, you know, talking about, uh, the, the old print, uh, model, uh, people that are listening probably don't know anything about today's front pages like I do. So whenever news, ha whenever big news happens, I'm always curious, what are different, how are different front pages representing the news? Do they make it big? Do they make it little? Do they make it not at all? Uh, talk to us a little bit about today's front pages and what is that? Um, today's front pages is uh, kind of a franchise that the Freedom and the New uh, Forum and the Museum have had for years at the Museum Building in Washington. The physical front pages were displayed out front on Pennsylvania Avenue for anyone to see every day, a selection from around the country and around the world, and also up in our front pages gallery in the museum. And I think it was a great opportunity for people to understand how, what, like you said, newspapers make decisions about what's important important because like on a big news day you would almost see a unanimity of you know like a continuous um, du duplication of the same headlines and the same emphasis on a big breaking news story but then you would see regional differences um, and you'd really understand the great country that we are because you'd see um, what the important stories were like in Iowa compared to the Eastern seaboard. Um, so, and then it was so fun to watch people, right? Go up to the interactive um, uh, display that we had where you could call up your hometown paper. Um, and many of them were away from home on visits to Washington, but man, they wanted to go over there and find their hometown newspaper that they hadn't seen that day. So it really showed you the connections that people had. And especially on big news days, people would gather on Pennsylvania Avenue, right in front of the front pages, 10 deep um, elections or uh, days when um, something particularly meaningful happened. Because it's still, I think, the news still matters to people no matter what form, but in many people's hearts, I know it's kind of dying. Uh, the printed page, the printed page really mattered. Today it's online and Patty uh, has, is really uh, making some uh, great, uh, putting together some great ideas to expand the franchise. And so Patty, why don't you jump in? Talk about today's front pages. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we want to expand. We've got more than 500 newspapers that people can access every morning um, from around the country and around the world, which is really kind of cool to see what's happening elsewhere. I want to grow that. I want more front pages. I want more digital only front pages. You know, before we kind of had this rule, we had to have a print newspaper. Why? You know, <laughs> you know, that's that's going the way of the dinosaur. So, um, yeah, I think we're going to um, reach out to some of the newspapers that we already reach and um, give them ideas of all the programs that we're doing to support journalists in local newsrooms. We've got all kinds of journalism programs where we take um, high school students um, and see if they're interested in journalism as a career and support them. And then we go through early career and leadership and mentorship. So um, we're really devoted to helping journalists do the work that they do by creating a different um, atmosphere in newsrooms, you know, um, we saw that the, the, the Me Too era um, hit newsrooms and major news organizations as it did all industries across this country. And so we're trying to um, shift that and trying to change the focus of newsrooms to make sure that people who have tra traditionally been not represented in roles of power in newsrooms get that opportunity. Um, and so we're actually trying to change the culture of newsrooms to produce a better news product that hopefully people can trust more because they see themselves in the, the, the pages of those or the scrolls of those news organizations. 
And a lot of the work you guys are doing in that area in training those who work in newsrooms, we've been honestly applying here. I know our leadership team has attended some of your uh, some of your training sessions, and it's been really helpful for us. And I see it uh, sort of absorbing into our our corporate culture. So um, I think you guys are doing great work there. Um, you mentioned schools. Um, you know, every once in a while you run into a student, you say, what are you majoring in? And they say journalism, you know, you think, wow, okay. Yeah, that is a thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so (laughs) talk to us about, uh, what, what you all at the Freedom Forum are doing, you know, to encourage students and to encourage young people who are going into journalism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have, we have something called um, the Al Newhart Free Spirit and Journalism Conference that we have every year. And we select, um, uh, thank you for asking this, Scott, because we're going to start um, uh, accepting applications very soon, this month, as a matter of fact. And so we select students from all 50 states um, who are interested in, well, who are free spirits and perhaps are interested in journalism as well. And um, we, for, uh, for the past two years, we've been doing this virtually on Zoom, but next year we're gonna do it in person again in Washington, DC. And we're gonna have a new uh, home in Washington, DC on the wharf, which is along the Potomac River, um, a very fun neighborhood. And so we're gonna bring people together and talk about you know, what the first amendment is all about, what it means to be a journalist and how we can help you and things you need to think about if you're looking at, at this as a career. So that's where we're gonna hope to hopefully capture people young when they're interested in this as a career. And then we go on with our power shift programs where we have inclusive leadership and workplace integrity. And we train um, journalism, you know, college students in journalism fields, as well as um, classroom or uh, news organizations themselves in how to make the, the culture of the newsroom a better place because a lot of people are just burning out. I mean, there's so much 24 seven news going on and there's trauma um, that people are covering, you know, from shootings all over the country to um, the Black Lives Matter movement and how that impacted people of color in newsrooms. So it's hard to be a journalist. It's not easy to go and see people on the worst day of their lives sometimes and have to report that back. So um, we're really conscious of that and trying to think of ways what we can do to support journalists to keep them in this important career in which they're defending our First Amendment freedoms and and telling us important things about our lives every day. One of the things that I I remember from the work that you guys are doing is when you talk about the fact that interns and, you know, the youngest employees are often those that are at the most risk. And so here we have incorporated a lot of the training. We have a lot of uh, students from the University of Tennessee at Martin who come in here every year new and they'll work, you know, for an internship for a semester. And so it's really been helpful to apply um, the work you guys are doing to make their experience uh, better and more meaningful. So, so Kathy, talk to us. A lot of people might not realize that there's a connection between uh, the Freedom Forum and Tennessee and a number of important Tennesseans. Elaborate on that for me. Okay. Um, Well, you know, first of all, can I just first back up and say that we really, the biggest connection that we have right now is that we spent some time talking to community members in Tennessee before we planned this event, talking to people in your county and in Union City. We held some focus groups and um, it really helped us think through what was important to Tennesseans uh, about the First Amendment. You know, we can talk about the history, but at this moment too, what really matters? And that was so Um, enlightening to us. Um, We ask people, you know, what First Amendment issues they're interested in? What, why does it matter to their lives now? What's most important? And what they told us is very much what we found in our national survey that people tend to value um, of the freedoms, the people tend to value most free speech and religious freedom. Um, So that's really important to know. Uh, But people are really worried that religious freedom is threatened today. And they also feel that free speech is threatened as well, Um, and that we live, obviously, in a really divided and divisive climate uh, all over the country, Um, and people are having a a really hard time figuring out how to get through that uh, and and discuss opposing viewpoints in a civil way. And we've talked about that in relation to this event that you're having here, you know, and how we want to make sure people understand this is not um, a right wing or left wing or, you know, conservative or liberal. I mean, this is the First Amendment is for everybody. And that's what we're going to be doing here. Um, 
what um as as you guys were i didn't get to i did not participate in your focus group because you know that wouldn't have been fair um <laughs> but um as you were talking to people those who i know well would text me and say oh my gosh that was fascinating you know so I, a lot of people really enjoyed uh, the focus groups. So, you know, and I don't even know what went on. I don't know if y'all were tasting jello or what was going on. So, so, uh, you know, what, what, um, you know, what, what were the focus groups like for those of us that didn't get to participate? I'll just share one thing that just struck stuck with me. Um, that was really meaningful. Um, one of your community members said so eloquently that, um, that they really, um, felt badly that, uh, people in this country don't realize what, uh, how, how, um, how treasured the First Amendment is in other countries around the world. Um, how the freedoms that we have are so um, aspired to and not uh, available to many countries around the world. We're kind of a beacon, right? As a country, we have these very unique freedoms. They are very unique in 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 across the world, and yet we we kind of. You know, in this country, we, to be honest, we kind of undervalue them a lot of the time and uh, totally, you know, can have some misconceptions and misunderstandings. But he was so passionate about wanting uh, us in this country uh, to treasure the, the First Amendment as much as those around the world who don't have it uh, would like to. And so uh, I was really heartened by that. And that was just some of the that was the thing that stood out most to me. Patty, you were in a lot of the groups. Uh, what did you feel like? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and one person said that when um, when he sees um, religious minorities being persecuted, that's when he knows it's time to get up out there and, and make some noise and, and change things. Um, and I would just add to what Kathy said that Tennessee has such a great First Amendment history. You know, it was Tennessee, the legislature in Tennessee, that rati finally ratified um, women's right to vote and made that law across the land. And certainly, uh, Kathy and I really appreciate that. Thank you, Tennessee, for that. Um, you know, it was the Freedom Riders in the 1960s who um, were uh, riding buses to protest segregation on, on bus lines throughout the South. And of course, the lunch counters in Nashville, where young students were sitting there for the right to be served in a public establishment. So um, Tennessee's First Amendment um, history is, is incredible. And today you're seeing people who are you know, talking about books and you know, should parents have a right to, um, to challenge the books that their students are reading in schools? Absolutely. That's what freedom of petition is all about. Um, and then uh, librarians and other parents are saying, wait a minute, we think that students should have access to age appropriate content. So there's a real First Amendment clash there in a conversation, but that's how we talk to each other um, as, as Americans. And then on a lighter side, of course, um, people like Elvis Presley, who um, is a famous Tennessean, not born there, but, but certainly lived there much of his life. And his free expression, the way he moved his hips was so shocking to Americans in the 1950s that it got him banned from performing in some places. But this is what the First Amendment is all about. It's about how you dance, the tattoos that you wear, how you express yourself as a person, the clothes that you wear. It's not all contentious matters. It's about how we express ourselves and our deepest beliefs to the rest of the world around us. Now, I know people who are listening have already learned something. I guarantee you, everybody listening has learned something. So when we get back from the break, we're going to talk a little bit about what you guys are specifically going to be doing here um, at Discovery Park of America um, on September 24th. This episode is brought to you by the Tennessee Department of Tourist Development. Visit tnvacation.com to start planning your next trip to Tennessee. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Scott Williams, and our guests today are Patty Rule and Kathy Trost, who are packing their bags and headed to Union City, Tennessee for our uh, First Amendment Day Festival. Is that is that the right? Is that what we're calling it? Well, it, it's the First Amendment Festival. First Amendment um, Festival. And, but 
it's actually related to First Amendment Day. The festival's on the 24th. First Amendment Day is a national day of recognition and celebration about the First Amendment, and that's on September 25th. So we love that we're aligned with that and that we can celebrate with all Americans when we're in Tennessee. I bet we will. I mean, I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty certain. I'd put a little money on the fact that we are going to be the coolest of all the celebrations <laughs> taking place around the, the country. So what will somebody, if I'm, if I'm listening and, you know, I want to come, whether I'm a retired person or I've got little kids, um, what will I experience when I come uh, on that Saturday? Sure. Um, well, we wanted, we deliberately created a festival because that's what we want it to be. We want it to be fun and fellowship, and we want to create an atmosphere where people uh, can um, really celebrate uh, the First Amendment and learn a little while they're having fun, um, and also give us an opportunity to learn from them. This, this is a big thing for us. We really want to listen when we're there to understand uh, how folks feel, and the theme is fun and freedom and fellowship. And with some of the things that you can do that day are really family oriented. So we'll have a full kind of midway of games, um, trivia games, um, the kind of yard games that you might play at home, but that are First Amendment themed with uh, prizes and a First Amendment scavenger hunt for kids. We'll have um, fast facts and snacks where you can get uh, a cookie and a quick uh, kind of express talk from one of our experts uh, about uh, different aspects of the First Amendment and ask questions if you have uh, any questions that you want to. You can take a selfie with some famous First Amendment heroes in our Walk of Fame. And uh, then the, the big events in the afternoon uh, include a headliner event from uh, a conversation with Fox News anchor Brett Baer, who's we're, we're going to have a real conversation with him about his career as a journalist and what the First Amendment has meant to him as a journalist and what it means today. And after Brett, we have a special musical performance from the legendary Grammy-winning Gatlin Brothers. Uh, so we're really excited. It's a, a, it's a really full Saturday. Uh, but the Friday before, um, we, uh, we're going to, our Freedom Forum educators will engage with local students uh, from, I think it's fifth grade on up to college, right? Uh, on some First Amendment basics. And those students will be doing some really creative art expressions that will then be on display uh, at the festival. Uh, so there's fun for every age. Now, I, I have had people ask me, um, are they going to be on a big screen instead of being here in person? And so the answer to that is no, they are physically Brett Bear and the Gatlin brothers will all be here. I mean, we're even bringing in a giant stage. You know, this is, it's all going to be on the front lawn. Folks from around here might remember back when we had some really big concerts here early on when they first opened Discovery Park. It'll be reminiscent of that. It, you know, it'll be uh, bring a lawn chair and a blanket and, you know, we'll have food trucks and um, adult beverages for sale. So it should be, um, it should be, you know, a, a huge one, one of the biggest events that we've actually ever had here at Discovery Park. So um, we're really excited. Yeah, and the first hundred people who come and get uh, uh, in, in line to to see Brett will get a copy of his latest book, and we've got lots of other. We're going to have a, a kind of drawing uh, uh, for prizes that I think Scott, you're going to pick the. The winner at the at the in the conversation and then i think brett and the gallon brothers will have a little bit of a conversation about what the first amendment has meant to them in terms of their long and legendary careers where because music is really one of the ultimate forms of free expression right uh so we you know we we really really want you to make sure that there's no rain um <laughs> Yeah, we've actually talked about that rain or shine. Bring your umbrella. Um, you did mention Brett Bayer's book, uh, which I'm reading right now. I'm almost done. Uh, it is uh, To Rescue the Republic, Ulysses S. Grant, The Fragile Union and the Crisis of 1876. Um, it's such mm -hmm. a good book. Um, it's just, I mean, it's really, I, I'm, social media has destroyed my attention span even worse 
you know, than it was years ago. And so uh, it, I, I was exciting to be able to actually read a book that that sucked me in and that I'm enjoying. And so I'm really excited. Hopefully, um, uh, he'll be asked about that. Uh, who is actually going to be asking the questions? Who should I who should I get the the desire to hear more about the book to? Uh, John Maynard, who, Scott, you remember well, uh, who's our uh, Senior Director of Programs at the Freedom Forum and who has been our longtime moderator of our Inside Media program back at the museum and is just a a really a great journalist and uh, conversationalist. And he'll be he'll be holding the conversation with Brett, but we're going to make space for audience questions. We'll have index cards uh, at seats, we think, or we're working that out, but we're going to have a way for audience members to ask questions uh, and try to get in as many as we can. Yeah. I mean, selfishly, um, I'm looking forward to having all of you here so we can show off um, our community, but then also I'm really excited for, you know, how an event like this can actually really change you know, everybody that lives here and it can, you know, really make an impact on the future um, of our entire region. I, I feel like um, one of our big goals is the for certainly to partner with you. And we are so proud of our partnership with Discovery Park. Um, it's going to make all the difference in terms of feeling trusted in your community and opening up people's hearts and minds to uh, to coming in and and being part of this festival, we hope. Um, But we also hope that we create kind of a meaningful relationship that lasts with the community and with the park and that you, many of you become our allies um, and allies to the first amendment as we, we, you know, sort of embark on a journey across America where we're really going to, you're the inaugural festival, um, uh, but we're going to continue to move around America and uh, listen and learn and celebrate the first amendment together. And we need, and we really hope that we create a, a group of people who become our allies with this as we go. I mean, to your point, we're in it. We're in a very unique, era where Mm -hmm. there's two very different opposing sides, if you will. And so there's Mm -hmm. many, many, many more people who are, you know, not necessarily on a side, you know, we, and so you don't know what to say. You don't know what to do. You don't know how to, how to, how to engage. And so I think through the first amendment, because the first amendment is for everybody, I think it's really going to be impactful for everybody here to be, if, if they know already, it's a great opportunity to remind them, you know, of the first amendment. And for those who haven't quite, you know, had time yet to dive in, I think it's really going to be enlightening, which is our whole mission here at Discovery Park. Yeah, and you know, we should reinforce that our mission is is nonpartisan. Um, That's really important to us. Um, Everyone in this country has First Amendment freedoms, right? Um, No matter who they are or what they believe. Uh, But all voices, all viewpoints are protected by the First Amendment. And we provide a forum for differing perspectives. And that's kind of what the festival is about. Because by doing that, we help safeguard the rights for everyone. Um, So if we want to enjoy First Amendment, freedoms, we need to protect them, right? Even those with whom we disagree. And that's what the Freedom Forum is all about, fostering First Amendment freedoms for all of us. Patty, I know that you were looking forward to eating barbecue when you're here. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. what, what else are you most looking forward to about coming to Discovery Park in Union City? I'm just looking forward to the conversations. Um, you know, you made a really good point, Scott, about how sort of divided we all are. But, um, you know, in meeting your your team and in our focus groups, um, we've been so st- um, struck by the graciousness and um, welcoming nature of, of the interest in the First Amendment. Um, I love that your theme is see beyond. And we hope that this is going to be a way that people can see beyond our differences to see we are one nation. We have these incredible freedoms that are the, the envy of the world over. Um, and we shouldn't take them for granted, um, but we should protect them for both the person with whom we agree and the person with whom we disagree. And that's what it's all about. You know, that the better ideas that in this marketplace of ideas and conversation, the best idea comes forth. Um, so, you know, yes, we can disagree and we can argue over the Thanksgiving table, but all in all, we're we're all here supporting democracy and our country and the values that we have. And so I'm just looking forward to talking with people and meeting everybody and seeing how they feel about the First Amendment and how we can better get our message across about its importance. Well, I can't wait to see you guys in person here at Discovery Park. Um, all my team is really, I'm having a ball working on planning and working with your team on planning. So I know it's going to be a huge success. 
we do, we think so, and we um, there. This couldn't be a better place to start. Um, so we really look forward to it, Scott and team. And thank you so much for having us. And thank you guys for being on the podcast today. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. See you soon. And I know everybody who's listened um, has said, "Oh, I'm coming to that." So uh, it's free. Um, can you believe we have a free day at Discovery Park of America? Um, you just have to pre-register for your tickets. If you go to discoveryparkofamerica.com slash 1A Festival, you can reserve uh, your tickets. Um, and I hope uh, to see you here that day. And, and thank you to all of you who've uh, joined us today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. Mm-hmm.